Yeah, thank you very much, Lemari, and uh, hello, hello everyone. It's great to see you all uh, interested in the Diff Hackathon and uh, you know, different topics that we that we have here. So, uh, yeah, like Lemari said, I can I can offer a bit of information about decentralized identifiers. Um, I'm sure you probably already have a bit of an idea what they are and uh, how they fit in as a as a building block together with some other technologies and, and protocols and uh yeah we're not uh we're not so many people so feel free to uh, just make this interactive uh, i'd be happy to focus specifically on on topics that you're interested in um i mean i have i, I have slides but uh, uh we can also make this di dynamic instead of me just uh, <laughs> lecturing for for uh, an hour, Limari, do we have an, an hour schedule? We have up to an hour, yeah, if yeah. you want to go the full hour. Yeah, so I'll just uh, start talking about, about deeds, but if, if anyone has a specific question or a specific topic that you're interested in, then uh, happy to uh, just be, be flexible on that. But uh, or just raise your hand or just... Uh, just uh, type something in chat or just interrupt me and any of that is fine. But uh, yeah, um, to get started, I mean, uh, some some basics about DITs. Uh, DITs are uh, a type of identifier, right? A, a type of address, a, a way of uh, referring to things, a way of, of identifying uh, subjects it could be individuals organizations uh, things um, whenever whenever we want to build a decentralized identity system we need uh, we, we always need identifiers right we need uh, we need identifiers to refer to things to name things uh, also individuals organizations we need uh, references identifiers as a as a basis for pretty much everything else and the deeds are a type of identifier that's uh, designed to be decentralized, right? So in uh, in contrast to other types of identifiers, like domain names or email addresses or usernames, those are not decentralized, right? Those are assigned by some central authority. Um, you have to go somewhere, you have to register a username, you have to register a domain name and, and pay for it. And so deeds are are designed to be different. Deeds are designed to be to work in a way that you where you can uh, create an identifier using uh, cryptography, using keys, uh, using decentralized infrastructures like blockchains or other other decentralized networks. And uh, therefore, it's 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 possible to create a deed uh, in a decentralized way, right, without dependency on a central authority that that issues or, or creates those deeds. Um, deeds have these things called methods, right? So there are different types of deeds. Uh, the, the method indicates where and how a deed is created and, and where it uh, lives, if if you want. Um, so there's not one, there's not just one uh, network or one blockchain or one technology for deeds, but you, you can think of deeds as bit of an abstraction layer uh, that, that works with different infrastructures and uh, different technologies. And that's what we call methods. And these deep methods can be very different, right? So here, the first one is a is a very popular deep method uh, that's called deep web that's used a lot. Um, in this case, the deep is actually based on a domain name and, and on a web server. So that's maybe not uh, not super decentralized, depending on uh, what you what your exact definition of decentralization is. Uh, but this is also a DIT, right? So this is a DIT that's based on uh, the DNS system and uh, and the web. Whereas the this one here, did EPSI and did Indie, those are DIT methods that are that are based on uh, blockchains or distributed ledgers. So in, in this case. If you create a DIT uh, using the DIT Indie method or the DIT EPSI method, then the DIT exists on a on a distributed on a distributed ledger. Um, 
but it's always controlled by you, by your by your private keys, by by the software, like a like a wallet, where where those uh, keys and deeds are managed. And the one on the bottom right is is also relative uh, a quite popular deed method. In in this case, the deed is actually just a a public key uh, essentially. So this is also a a form of deed where where it's uh, basically just a, a public key that's used as an as an identifier. And uh, here are some some more examples. Here's the definition of of a deed. What it looks like. This is taken from the official standard. So I forgot to mention that these are a, a standard in the World Wide Web Consortium. And uh, by now there are many different uh, deed methods. Uh, and here, here are some more examples of the more popular ones or the better known ones. But again, the underlying system is um, what makes the deed work. Uh, the, the place where the deed lives. This depends on the on the deed method, and that can can always be a little bit different. Um, there are also deeds on the Ethereum network, uh, for example, deeds on Bitcoin network, or deeds that uh, just don't use blockchains and use other other technologies. Um, where are deeds used? So uh, here are some general situations where deeds can be uh, can be used. Deeds by themselves are, are are not really useful for the end user, right? A, a deed by itself is just an identifier. It, does, it, it doesn't provide a specific application or or service, but deeds are used uh, as a building block by by a lot of other technologies and. Uh, in this slide, you can see some of the most important uses of, of deeds. Uh, the first one is verifiable credentials, right? So you may have heard about, or you probably have heard about this technology as well. So uh, um, a verifiable credential is, uh, you, can, you can think of that as a digital identity document, right? Like a driver's license, like a university diploma, like a birth certificate or membership at a, at a library or membership at a soccer club or any kind of attestation, any kind of uh, statement uh, made by an issuer about a subject, right? So a verifiable credential is always issued by someone and issued and contains statements about someone or, or something and this is where deeds are used, right? So the deeds, the deeds by themselves, deeds by themselves do uh, usually not carry any kind of personal data, right? So the deed uh, doesn't have uh, a name or a date of birth or anything attached to the deed itself. But this kind of information is expressed using verifiable credentials, and the deeds are the thing that that makes these verifiable credentials work because the, the deeds are the identifiers for the issuer of the credential and for the subject of the of the credential. Um, and uh, yeah, another another common application is is our use a common use of deeds is authentication. Uh, there's not just one one protocol for this. There are different uh, protocols like uh, OpenID for verifiable credentials. Uh, there, there's a set of uh, profiles of the OpenID protocol that can be used for uh, authenticating, basically for logging into to websites, and uh, that that can also be done done with a with a deed, um, because deeds always have associated uh, cryptographic keys, right? So if you have a deed, you can. Um, I have that on the on the next slide. But if you have a deed, then there's also always an associated key pair, a private key and public key, uh, for controlling the deed, and and therefore you can you can use deeds for authentication protocols. You can use deeds for verifiable credentials. You can use deeds to uh, create uh, cryptographic signatures. You could you could sign any any payload, including. Uh, the PDFs or uh, XMPP messages or emails, or or really anything can be 
can be uh, can be signed and uh, also encrypted with with DITs. So DITs, DITs provide a, a public key infrastructure, right? A, a decentralized public key infrastructure. Um, and a, a third thing is also service discovery. So DITs can can also be used to look up uh, services that are associated with with the with the identifier services could be um, an XMPP messaging service or uh, something that we we call uh, a decentralized web node. So that's another interesting technology. That's uh, something like a personal Dropbox or or something like that. But you can you can think of deeds also as a as a mechanism for looking up uh, services for looking up um, endpoints, API endpoints, protocol endpoints. So the, the the general idea of a deed is that if I give you my deed, then you can look up technical metadata, you can look up public keys, you can look up uh, services. You can find the, the information that you need uh, to communicate with me, uh, right? That's the that's the basic idea. Uh, it's as a as a discovery mechanism. And uh, let me skip over this. And and the way the way how this works is using uh, what we call deed resolution, right? So this is the most important function that deeds uh, deeds provide uh, a technical. Uh, technical process. Uh, this means that when you have a deed, you can look up this kind of information that you see here on, on the slide. This is called a, a deed document. Um, and again, as I said earlier, this does not contain uh, personal data. So you, you cannot find my name or address or date of birth here, but you can find uh, this kind of technical metadata about the identifier. Uh, you can find my public key you can find uh, services that that uh, that you can use to communicate with me, right? So again, that's the that's the basic idea of a did. You can resolve the did, and you can find the technical metadata that is needed in order to interact with the with the subject in a in a secure way. Um, and, and all of that without a central authority, right? So all of this works in a decentralized way. How exactly the resolution works, so how exactly do you get from the deed to the deed document? Uh, let's say if you have this deed here that you that you see on the slide, it says deed colon epsi colon, and then this uh, uh, random looking string. Uh, the, the process of res resolving the deed, that depends on the deed method, right? So I, I said earlier that sometimes deeds are uh, based on uh, DNS and web servers. Sometimes deeds are based on a blockchain. Sometimes deeds are based on other decentralized networks. And these deed methods, they define how exactly you, you are, you're able to look up this data structure, this deed document. Um, so sometimes uh, you need to uh, download information from a web server. Sometimes you need to look up information from a blockchain. Sometimes you need to uh, retrieve some messages from a from a uh, distributed hash table or other kind of network. This depends entirely on the on the DIT on the DIT method. Um, let's see any. Any questions so far, maybe about these these basic concepts? Okay. Um, yes. So sorry, I didn't I didn't mention that the difference between verification method here and authentication. Uh, the verification method property uh, here you have an array of public keys uh, so there can also be more than one that there could be five or ten public keys also of different types in the D document uh, but this verification method property this just says that here is a list of 
of keys that belong to the div, uh, but it doesn't say what, what they are for, right? And the authentication block, you can see that this reference is the, the key up here. This is what we call a verification relationship. Uh, that's also here on the, on the left side. And this is uh, basically the purpose of the key. So this, in, this indicates what this key should be used for, for, for what purpose. Um, and th there are some, in the standard, there are some defined verification relationships like authentication. This means that this key can be used to um, authenticate, to, to log in, uh, for example, to a website. Uh, whereas a, a different purpose could be assertion. Uh, it's actually called assertion method. So it, it would say it would say here instead of authentication, it would say authentication. Uh, it would say assertion method. And that means that this is a key that is used to make assertions to make uh, to to sign statements, uh, especially in the case of verifiable credentials. Right. So going back going back to to this slide the. The first use of deeds that I have that I have here, verifiable credentials. Um, in, in this case, a verifiable credential would be signed with a key, which in the deed document has the relationship uh, assertion method. But uh, you would not use a key that has the purpose uh, authentication. Right. This is what you would use here if you if you use a key to if you use a deed to log in somewhere to just authenticate to to just prove that you control the deed, then you would use then you would use a, a key that 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 says uh, authentication. So it's basically different purposes of the keys. Uh, there's also encryption encryption keys. Uh, you do the same for controller. So in this example, I don't have, I don't have controller. Um, the the D document data model also defines a property called controller. Uh, you can use that if you want to have a did that is not controlled by the subject, uh, right? So the the did that that's indicated here as the ID, that's the subject uh, which is described by the deed document and which is identified by the deed, but you could indicate uh, using another property called controller, you could specify another deed which controls this deed. Uh, this, this can be used in, in situations like a parent-child relationship, right? Where parent controls a, a child's deed, um, then you can, can list a, a controller, but uh, no, you cannot do that in, in the same way as, as with the key. So the, if you list a controller, then that would sort of be a global, well, uh, that would be a, a setting for the for the whole deed. Uh, you, you cannot do that for for individual keys. You can only do that for the, the deed itself. Uh, you're welcome. Just feel free to to ask. Um, wanted to show this this slide quickly. So just a comparison of deeds with other identifiers. So like UUIDs, nicknames, uh, domain names. There are also some identifiers called DOIs and RGIDs and and so on. Uh, to my knowledge, deeds are the only the only type of identifier at least that, that I'm aware of that are at the same time decentralized, meaning they don't require central authority. And they are uh, persistent. So persistent means that uh, they are not reused, right? So if you have a deed, then uh, you're the only one who will ever be able to to control the, the deed. It is, not, it is not reused like a domain name, right? A domain name is not persistent because over time somebody else may may have the same domain name, and deeds are uh, resolvable. What we what we just talked about. Uh, the the one property that deeds don't have compared to other identifiers is here, 
delegatable or by, by that I I meant something like a hierarchical namespace, right? So in in domain names you can have subdomains. Uh, if you control a domain name, you can set up a subdomain and a subdomain and and so on. So you cannot you cannot do that with with this. Um. Yeah, I mentioned. Uh, Marcus, um, on that previous slide. Yep. That one there is there is there something I can look at that's a little more detailed that goes into the differences between dibs and other identifiers? If you can think of, if not, um, you can circle back to it when you remember. Um, I'm not sure. The only thing I can think of is this this book, right? This the SSI book, Self Sovereign Identity, um, by the publisher Manning. So there's a there's a book. It's a it's a few years old, but it's still um, applicable in in some way. Uh, there's a chapter about dits, and and that I think has a bit more information about the different identifiers. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look. It looks like Kim has her hand up too. Yeah, I think I caught myself furrowing my brow at the delegatable one, but I think I was thinking about the ability to delegate, which could be done through a combination of like DIDs and VCs, but you're talking about delegate, delegatability of the identifier itself. So I think that makes sense. Uh, I really like this uh, here, just making sure I understand what you're saying there. You're talking about control of the actual identifier or I, I'm trying to think how to be precise about that in fact, because it's different from controller but yeah can you speak about that a little bit more yeah yeah it's not a it's not a good good name here delegatable because that can mean a lot of a lot of different things um so this this is not about delegating control of the identifier right just a, a few minutes ago we talked about uh we talked about the controller the controller feature in the in the d document that in, in the d document you can indicate a controller uh, which is another deed that controls the the, the deed that you that you're looking at uh, so so that is a form of of delegation that you can do with deeds and that's that's not what this diagram is that that's not what is meant here by delegatable uh, what it, uh, what this means here in this case is uh, having a a hierarchical namespace right so so having having a a deed underneath a, a deed in in the in the sense of of subdomains, for example, right where you have example.com and then and then under example.com you can have um, a test.example.com and under that you can have www.test.example.com right so there's this this uh, hierarchy there's a there's a tree where you have sub namespaces um, as as much as as you want and where the where the 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 authority of a domain name controls the resolution of the namespace underneath, right? So the resolution of a of a subdomain is controlled by the the authority of the of the domain name, and uh, you don't have that in in deeds at all. This concept, right? You you always have a just a deed, and you resolve the deed according to the deed method. And you cannot uh, you cannot have a sub deed or or something like uh, like that in where where you you subdivide the the namespace and you you you, del you delegate you don't you don't delegate resolution of identifiers underneath your your deed as you as you do in in domain names you you don't right you don't, you don't have that in in deeds because in deeds you don't really need that because deeds are are decentralized anyway and, and anyone can create as many deeds as as you want anyway and there's not really this this need to have a hierarchical namespace as in as in domain names. Okay, hey, so yeah I'm not sure what people are mostly interested in. I have a bit of uh, so slides about um, a universal resolver, right? That's a 
and Universal Registrar. So those are both uh, open source projects at, at DIFF. Um, that uh, that can be used for working with DITs, right? For resolving DITs, uh, for creating DITs. Uh, maybe it's worth showing that. Showing that quickly. So uh, the, as I mentioned, there are different DIT methods, right? The DITs are not just one technology. They're, they don't just use one specific network or infrastructure. But you have a lot of different DID methods, and the Universal Resolver is actually one of the oldest projects at uh, DIFF, one of the original things that DIFF started to work on. And it's basically an open source tool you can use to, uh, to resolve a DID, right? So I can see a lot of examples here. I can pick one example DID, I can click uh, Resolve and and it will return uh, the DIT document, right? And this is the this is the the superpower of DITs. If if you want that, even though you have all these different DIT methods and all these different technologies, the the input and the output of the resolution process is always the same, and the data format here is is standardized. Um, it's important to point out that what you're looking at here is one well-known instance of the universal resolver that uh, diff is hosting and uh, you at uniresolver.io and you can use that for testing purposes and experimentation but this is not 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 meant as a production service right and did resolvers are designed or are intended to be decentralized anyway so you shouldn't be relying on a on a single service that that uh, that exposes a a resolver, but instead you can you can host your own instance of the universal resolver, or you can also use a range of other tools that that also provide uh, the DIT resolution function. I have a list. I have a list on one of the one of the next slides. Uh, Susan, uh, DIT methods are rapidly expanding. Okay, the did TDW and PLC. How are they different from other DIT methods? So, uh, did TDW? Uh, you're right that this is not not listed here in the Universal Resolver uh, yet. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll add it uh, hopefully hopefully soon. Did TDW is a is a DIT method, uh, which is also a, a work item here at, at DIFF at the moment. Uh, that's called Trust DIT Web, DIT TDW. And this one is very much like the DIT Web method. So here in the Universal Resolver, there's also an example of a DIT Web. Oh, this one doesn't, doesn't work for some reason. This one works. So did web, as, a, as I said, is a, is a did method that has been getting a, a lot of uh, interest and has been very popular. In this case, the did is basically just a file on a web server. So it's really simple and really easy to use. You don't need blockchains or anything like that. Uh, this one didn't work apparently, did web. I can oh. do that dot foundation so maybe on our div uh, web server maybe the did dot json file is missing for some reason or yeah i'll look into that or something like that uh so yeah did, did web is, is very popular and, and very simple but it also has some uh, drawbacks so it's uh not really verifiable you're just uh, trusting uh, a file that you're downloading from a web server so it doesn't really fulfill a, a lot of the original intentions of of deeds it's it's not it's not so persistent it's not so decentralized it, it's not so verifiable as deeds were designed to be and uh, so that's why there's a, a new work item on a did method called did tdw which is very similar to did web it's also uh, very simple and uh, using just files on web servers but it adds uh, some 
some features in terms of making the deal more verifiable and also maintaining a, a history of previous versions of the deed. Um, I didn't really I didn't really mention that, but one thing that's also super important about deeds is that this the document uh, can be changed, right? So deeds can be created, but deeds can also be updated. So you can rotate the keys here and you can change the services associated with the deed and you don't have to change the deed itself, right? So that's what makes a deed persistent. That's what enables uh, a key rotation. That's what enables data portability. So if you want to change the location of a service that you're using, uh, you don't have to change the deed. Uh, this can be this can be really powerful. It it can mean that, for example, if you're building a a social network uh, based on deeds, or you're building an XMPP messaging network uh, or a microblogging network, you're building something like that using deeds, then uh, uh, the functionality that this provides is that you can switch, for example, from one server to another, you can change the location of your XMPP server, you can change the location of your activity pub or Mastodon servers, but you don't have to change your identifier. So your address book and your social graph can, uh, can continue to work. Uh, you're just changing uh, the location of, of your service, but you don't change the, the identifier and the, the connections that you have. So this is an important feature. And with did web, uh, this doesn't work so well, or it's not verifiable. And so the TDW is a, is a did method that tries to fix some of these shortcomings. Uh, and uh, of course, we hope we hope to add that soon to the universal resolver. I'm not sure if that answered the uh, a question. Um, there's also a question about did PLC. So did PLC uh, is it? That's actually here. Let's see if there's a, a working example. Yeah. So uh, did PLC is used by uh, Blue Sky. So that the Blue Sky uh, microblogging platform or net network. And uh, this is not really a very sophisticated did method because this did method is essentially based on a, on a central service. So it uh, contradicts a little bit the, the design goals and the, the ideology of, of deeds if, if you want. It's not, not really a very decentralized identifier, but it's, it's used by, yeah, by a fast growing uh, prominent network, uh, the, the, blue, the blue sky network. The, the reason why it's called PLC, that means place placeholder, is because the the intention of the of the authors here, the intention of the people behind Blue Sky, is to use this uh, until they decide which real did methods they they want to use. So they they made up something like a, a temporary did method that's that's uh, quite centralized, but it's it's working and it's very scalable, and so they're they're investigating and. Uh, Evaluating other other data methods that they would then switch switch over to and, and use in the in the longer term. Okay, you're welcome. So um, yeah, this is the Universal Resolver project. Um yeah, here's a here's a screenshot. But uh, there are there are also uh, libraries and tools, uh, other open source projects. Uh, for example, Veramo, that's also a, an open source project here at Diff. Um, so there there are a lot of tools that uh, 
that, that also have deep resolution built in, right? So you don't always need a need the universal resolver or don't always need to run an instance of the of the universal resolver. There are also open source projects, libraries, SDKs that already have some of this functionality uh, built in. And they may not support all, all deep methods. So we would have to look at the uh, documentation or you would have to maybe think uh, think about which did methods you want to support. Uh, do you want to support many did methods or are you building something where you don't need all the all the did methods? Um, so that's that's a bit of a question that that comes up in, in many many decentralized identity projects. Um, how many did methods are there? Uh, how many of them are really important? How many and which ones? Uh, are are useful for a certain application or a certain project. But uh, just so you understand that there are these different did methods, they are based on different infrastructures and uh, sometimes have different uh, features and different capabilities. And uh, yeah, while I'm talking about actually, why don't I just uh, skip a little uh, to this thing here, sorry, I'm um, jumping back and forth a little bit, but this fits uh, this fits into this topic of, of having different did methods. This is a relatively new work item that we also uh, just started at diff. Uh, it's called did trades. And uh, this is a, a mechanism or a, a framework to uh, to compare deeds or to, to articulate and uh, document different capabilities of, of deeds. Uh, so for example, deeds can also be, so I, I mentioned that deeds can be created, uh, deeds can be updated, and deeds can also be deactivated. And uh, this is something that not all did methods support, for example, right? So there are, there are did methods that where you can create a deed and you can resolve a deed, but you cannot deactivate a deed because the underlying deed method doesn't support that. Um, another example that I mentioned already is the, the history, uh, right? So being able to look up previous versions of the deed, previous versions of the of the deed document. Uh, this is also supported by some deed methods and not not by other deed methods. Um, is the is the deed human readable, uh, does the did method support something called pre-rotation? Pre so that, that means that before you rotate the key, uh, do you already have a, um, a secure commitment to, to a hash of the next key? And, uh, and things like that. So it's a, it's a quite new work item that's getting a lot of attention, uh, not only in DIFF, but also in other organizations and, and other communities because because deeds are an, an abstraction layer basically on top of uh, different underlying infrastructures web servers blockchains and and so on and uh, there are at least uh, 200 did methods now and uh, nobody can use and support all of them so it's a common common question of uh, which ones should be used for uh, for creating and and managing identifiers, and this is a, a, a interesting approach to uh, to try and do that or help with uh, help with understanding the differences. Um, let's see how much time do we have left. Not so much. Let's see what people are interested in. I have uh, I have a bit more information about did URLs. So did uh, can have a path and a query string and a fragment. This is what we call a did URL. Just like in HTTPS URLs, you can you have a domain name and then you can have a path and a query string and a fragment. I could talk about this a little bit. Uh, then I also have a bit more information about how to create and update and 
manage dits. And then I also have a few slides about how dits fit in with other types of identifiers. So how dits can be linked and connected to uh, something called LEIs or domain names or X509 certificates. So maybe, I don't know, do, do people want to indicate in the in the chat maybe or tell me what's, uh, what sounds most interesting? I'll put it here in the... In the chat, maybe since we don't have that much time left, uh, which which topic seems most interesting, or or anything else, or any other any other topic that you're interested in? Okay. Okay. So let's try to cover the the first two, maybe. Uh, self-reference and dates. Okay, maybe we, we do that in the end. Okay, let me talk a bit of, about the, the deep URLs and a bit about the, the CRUD, about managing, and then and see what, what questions are still open. Uh, so here are some examples of, of deep URLs. Again, deep URL is a, is a DIT followed by an optional path, followed by an optional query string, and an optional fragment, very much like it is in HTTPS URLs. Here are a few more examples. And, uh, and the simplest one actually is the first one. So uh, Mahamud, you, you said, can you explain, can you expand on the DIT URL fragment? So if you just have a DIT with a fragment, then uh, what the fragment identifies is something in the DIT document, inside the DIT document. Right, so if you have a if you have an HTTPS URL with a domain name, and then you have a fragment, then the fragment identifies something inside the HTML page, and in this case, uh, a fragment like here in the first example identifies something in the the document. Uh, in this case, it's it's it identifies uh, a specific key in the the document. Right, if I go back, if I go back to the example of a the document, you can actually see here that there's a deed with a fragment. So the fragment is just an identifier for something inside the inside the D document. So you can uh, you can use this kind of deed URL to point uh, to a specific key inside the D document or a specific service in the D document. Uh, when it comes to per uh... sorry, sorry. Question. No, when it comes to parameters, these query strings, then uh, there's a lot of lot of ex extra functionality uh, that can that expands on the basic deed resolution uh, process. So there are uh, this this is not a complete list here. These are just some examples, but by adding parameters when you resolve the deed. Um, you're providing additional instructions to the to the resolver to do something uh, in addition to just resolving the D to the D document. Uh, for example, uh, version ID, version time, those are ways to identify uh, or to resolve a specific version of the D document as opposed to the latest version, right? So I, I mentioned that the the document can be updated. It can change over time. The keys, the services can can change. Uh, but if if you if you pass a parameter as part of the DIT URL, then you can instruct the resolver to return a, an earlier version of the DIT document. And you can do that by either passing in a timestamp or a specific version identifier. So if the the document has been updated 10 times over the last few years, for example, then with the version ID parameter, you could you could identify a specific version of the, the 10 versions in the history. But again, this is not something that's supported by all the did methods, right? So that's where the did traits uh, come in to describe which did methods support this functionality and uh, which ones don't. And uh, 
Some other examples are a parameter called transform keys. Uh, that's a, a way to transform uh, the, the public keys in the, the document to different representations like uh, JSON web key or multi-base encoded or base 58 encoded and so on. There's some parameters to control caching. And then there are also some interesting, uh, relatively new ideas that are still in the in the process of really being specified, uh, where you can theoretically use a DDRL to reference any any type of resource. So if you if you have a did and then you have a path like slash who is, or you have some specific parameters like in this case resource name resource type then the did url uh, would uh, return any type of of resource and that is up to the did method to support and to specify that so a did url with a path could for example also return a pdf document or an image file or uh, a mp3 file or a, or a json object Right, so this is something that different communities and different did methods are still working on and uh, beginning to to understand. But uh, you can see how a did URL with a path and a, a query string could be a, a very uh, flexible namespace, right? In a in a similar way as on web servers, you can you can you can upload anything to a web server, and when you when you open an HTTPS URL in the browser, you you can get back anything from a web page to a video file to a PDF document. And did URLs can are also designed to to be able to to work like that uh, potentially. It's it's something that's often not needed. So in in most applications of dids, actually uh, you don't need. You don't need much of this. You just want to resolve it and get the DIT document and look up the public keys. That's all you want most of the time. But in, in theory, DIT URLs provide this very extensible uh, pattern to, to describe any arbitrary kind of, of resource while while still maintaining all the advantages of DITs themselves, right? So you have, still have the decentralization and you still have the persistence and uh, verifiability of these identifiers. And uh, yeah, now um, let me rush a little bit maybe to the CRUD stuff. Uh, so how did get created and updated and deactivated? Uh, this again uh, depends pretty much completely on the did method, right? So in the case of the did web method, for example, the way how you create a did is by uh, registering a domain name and uploading a file to a web server and in, whereas on in the case of a blockchain based deeds uh, did you you create a deed by writing some kind of transaction to to a blockchain uh, so that is very different for for each deed method uh, however as as another work item at if we have started to work on a specification called Deed registration, where we also try to define an, an abstraction layer or a universal interface for creating and updating and deactivating deeds um, to basically define a certain inputs and, and outputs of a creation function and an update function and a deactivation function. Again, how, how that actually is executed uh, by the concrete did method is is different every time, but still it's possible to define a, a generic universal interface where you could then plug in uh, different uh, did methods. And uh, this is something we have done in the universal registrar project, right? So there's universal resolver at diff and there's also a universal registrar. This is not so popular and not so well uh, developed and not, not so well maintained as the as the resolver but basically it is it is possible to to uh, generalize and to define a, a universal 
interface uh, for also for creating and updating and deactivating. And, and you can see in this specification that there are some common inputs and outputs. Um, um, going to run a bit out of time, but just to, to mention this maybe quickly that when when creating a did uh, there's there's the big question of key management, right? So the one fundamental idea of dits is of course that there's a private key that you control. And so when you create a did, you also need to create and and then manage uh, cryptographic keys typically in a in a wallet. And uh, those should not be uh, controlled by anyone other than you, right? So uh, so when you think about RAT with DITs and uh, creating and updating and deactivating DITs, then you could use remote services. You could use some APIs like the universal registrar service, for example, but the cryptographic keys that control the did that those should remain on the on the client side, right? So if if you're interested in the details of this, uh, take a look at the did regis registration specification at at diff. There's a lot of content and a lot of a lot of thoughts on how a a client can interact with the did re registration service. Uh, without losing control of the of the private keys, so that's that's the most important the most important part there. And uh, now let me see what questions we still have. Um, the view on the who is product protocol being implemented in other did methods. Yes. Yeah, so going back to these. These examples, in the case of the TDW method, there is this function slash who is, which returns uh, which returns actually a, a verifiable presentation that contains verifiable credentials about the subject. So that's a way of telling you, for example, that uh, a subject subject identified by this deed is a is a bank or is a, it's a university or is some government agency right it's a way of because the deed by itself is is trustless that the deed itself doesn't tell you anything about who's behind it uh, so you can look up uh, verifiable credentials uh, that are contain verifiable information about the deed subject that's what this slash voice is doing and uh, yeah i think it would be useful to to support to generalize that and support it in other did methods as well. And uh, related to that, I can also mention another very interesting work item at diff, uh, which is called linked VP, linked verifiable presentations. Um, you can look at that too. And this is this is a a generalized way, a universal way of looking up verifiable credentials associated with a, a with a deed. So this works with any deed method. The way how this works is that you just resolve the deed to a deed document, and in the deed document, you find a service endpoint, and at that service endpoint, you find a verifiable presentation about the deed, which can then tell you if this is a university or uh, what kind of institution uh, is is behind the deed. So this is almost the same as the as the who is uh, function. Um, it, it actually the who is function actually uses this specification, but this already works with uh, with any did did method. And I think we're we're out of time, right? Um, there would be more, more things to talk about. Of course, uh, here is a quick um, uh, advertising for our working group at, at DIFF, Identifiers and Discovery Working Group. That's where we discuss all, all these topics related to DITs and other things. We're always uh, interested in new participants, new topics, so feel free to just uh, Join or uh, also feel free to 
reach out to me. Um, if there's any any other thing you'd like to discuss. And uh, that's it, I think. Uh, thank you. Good luck with the hackathon. And I'm also looking forward to see all the uh, all the results of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, we made a channel actually for this session in case everyone, anyone has any follow-up questions afterwards. Um, I'll go ahead and drop that in the chat as well. Um, yeah, please do. Sorry, I just I just realized this has, has our contact information at um, Daniel Tech. I, I didn't put the diff contact information, but... Uh, but yeah, for for diff, so either either find us here at this identify and discovery working group or the, the link that that Lamari just just shared. Um, yeah, go we'll go ahead and you can continue the discussion there. Um, but thank you so much, Marcus. It was a great discussion, and it was great having that review and overview of all the the new work items that are happening um, in the ID work group. So. Awesome. Thanks once again. And thanks anyone, everyone for attending. And we look forward to seeing your creative submissions during this hackathon. Yeah, thank you very much. Good luck. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.